Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Galley. I uh, did my bachelor's at the University of Victoria, then my PhD at Memorial University with Colin Farkasen and John Jameson, and now I'm a postdoc with Mark Cannington's group at Ottawa U. Uh, and here to give the geophysics perspective to the Metal Oceans uh, group, specifically doing some modeling to look at one of the types of microplate boundaries, um, specifically the spreading centers, and seeing if we can identify them in the Abitibi, sort of in the ancient setting there. Uh, just recognizing some of our partners, um, much of the software I use is open source, so I really appreciate that, so I want to throw that up there. Um, you're just leading into the objective for the talk. So really what I was hoping to do, uh, and still hoping to do, is determine some kind of metric for metal endowment in greenstone belts. And the metric I'm looking to find is uh, the, how many spreading centers or rifts he might have in the ancient setting. So hopefully more spreading centers and more rifts will lead to more VMS, which would be more endowed. And looking to do this by modeling gravity data, so producing 3D density models of the crust and from that pulling out crustal thickness. And then I'll do the same in the Lao Basin as well as the Abitibi, using the Lao Basin as a proxy. So I won't introduce this too much more because it's been done quite a bit by Mark and Alan. Uh, but really, the Lao Basin is important for this because we've already identified, uh, just get the laser pointer. We've already identified where the spreading centers are. So by putting together 3D density models and seeing what characteristics these spreading centers have, these sorry, these spreading centers have here, hopefully then when we do the same type of modeling, the Abitibi, we see the same characteristics. We can then start to interpret them as potential spreading centers as well. The two data sets I used, one was the GSC gravity data over the Abitibi, and then the other one was a satellite altimetry derived data set over the Lao Basin. Um, and yeah, thinned it a little bit, and then can use that to produce a 3D model of the Earth. So looking at the data itself really only gives you a 2D plane, uh, but by modeling it, it gives you that depth information of what's going on deeper into the crust. So from a 3D model where you solve for a distribution of density, both laterally and vertically, um, you can pull out a density isotherm, so the 3.07 grams per cubic centimeter isotherm that correlates with the MOHO. Um, and this modeling was done following the workflow developed by Kim Welford at Memorial University, who's been doing this for a little over a decade, where you can put together these three density models, isolate the isotherm that corresponds to the MOHO, and then use that to produce crustal thickness maps. And because gravity modeling is notoriously non-unique, uh, you really need to use some sort of verification. So what Kim did and what I also did was use uh, seismic information. So from seismic surveys, you can pull out, so in this case, the seismic survey identified the MOHO as this thicker black line, and you can use that to verify against your inversion model's MOHO, which in this case is the gray line here, to make sure that they're lining up properly. And then the assumption being that if it lines up along the cross sections that you have, you can then assume that it should also represent the MOHO on the in-between, and you can create a crustal thickness map. The two main products I pulled out, in addition to the MOHO elevation map that can be turned into a crustal thickness map, I also looked at the density variations along the surface. Um, so those main two things that can be seen as maps rather than looking with the, the whole 3D model. And then the model was constructed by breaking up the Earth into a number of pixels, because you need to break it up to be able to solve for density inside each of the different pixels. Uh, so I used Memorial University's code uh, that works with tetrahedra, so it can better fit the topography in the area. Admittedly, in the Abitibi, topography doesn't change a whole lot, so it wasn't as important there. But it was really key in the Lao Basin, where you could have fairly tall, you have the subduction zone, the trench in there, a bunch of volcanoes around, that to be able to fit that properly um, was needed to create an accurate 3D Earth model. So now I'll start off by looking at the Lao Basin, because we have a bit more information about that. So I have a bathymetric map here over on the right with spreading centers and microplate boundaries identified, and then a plan view map of the 3D model shown here on the left showing density variation, so blue being low density, red being high density. So just right away you can kind of see that the, the, the ridges, the more felsic ridges, much more low density. You have the old, cold, dense, uh, subducting Pacific plate there, uh, as well as some variations within the basin. We actually have lower density crust uh, further in where the, the basin is just beginning to open and any new crust being produced is much more heavily influenced by 
the subducting slab, whereas further north you get, you get more mature spreading, which just leads to higher density basalts being produced as there are less influence from, from the slab. To verify the model, we have three, these sort of A, B, and C, these three transects that pass through that contain some segments of seismic surveys. Um, so here it's a little harder to see. The dotted white line are seismic surveys, and then the white dots represent the global crust 1.0 model, so two models that compared the, the black line, the gravity MOHO to. Uh, so this is uh, the model's MOHO compared to the seismic ones, which fits quite well within the basin. Two main areas of note where you don't quite have a good fit underneath the ridges of the crust 1.0 model, but that's due to a sort of an issue with or an assumption needed to create their global model. Uh, a typical way to solve for crustal thickness in Earth systems is to assume a homogeneous density for the crust and a homogeneous density for the mantle and then solve for the interface between the two. It's just much more computationally cheaper. Um, but because we're able to solve for lateral changes in density as well, you can have, because you have a lower density ridge, you can be able to resolve that, that route a little bit more. The other area of note is underneath the four arc the MOHO didn't quite line up there. Um, but going a bit further into the study, in their inversion model, they actually had this dip, and in their gravity model, the dip was needed as well. So they sort of forced through forward modeling uh, sort of a lap of this thing. Um, but this thinning exists because when the basin was first opening and the four arc first formed, there was a lot of extension going on through the four arc. They never quite switched over to spreading as it leapt across to the other side of the volcanic arc and created a bunch of spreading centers. But you still have uh, seafloor spreading that had occurred that um, that remains to be uh, sort of a relic in, in, in the, the crustal thickness model here. And then by taking the MOHO depth, you can subtract that from the elevation and you can get this crustal thickness map here. So here you can see the ridges are very thick along the volcanic arc. You have thinning occurring where you have seafloor spreading and also where you have uh, these uh, volcanic assemblages, I'll get into a bit more, you have a lot more thicker crust where you have a considerable amount of melt piling up underneath. Look at the two different spreading styles that Mark uh, and Alan both talked about. In the south, where you have slower spreading, it's accommodated by just the single spreading center, so you can see just this single area of extension going on here. But just to the west, you also see this relic of extension that is left over from when the basin was first opening up. So this presumably extends down. You can see it a little bit in the bathymetry as it extends down toward New Zealand. But when the basin was first opening, you had this rift forming. But then, as is uh, usually the case in these systems, spreading hopped closer to the volcanic arc. And you actually got seafloor spreading occurring, but the model is able to resolve. So there was relic rifting that was going on. Then comparing this to the north, where you have much more rapid expansion, so it has to be accommodated by multiple spreading centers. So you can see just all these areas of thinning where the crust is being opened up, uh, especially around this thick, thick crusted volcanic field, um, where you have these piecewise spreading occurring around there. Zooming in a volcanic arc, there's a few things you can pull out of this model. So one will just be information we can find about the volcanic arc. So I just boxed in the arc there. Tough to see the density variations in the map here. So here I highlighted the outline for the arc polygon in white, and then each individual volcano's polygon is drawn in here, colored based off of its density. So blue, low density, red, higher density. And then underneath, it's a bit more relevant, I'll talk about it in a bit, uh, there is colored the, the depth of the subducting slab, so blue being deep, orange being shallow, uh, and then a seamount chain I'll talk about in a bit as well. But you can see there is, the, the volcanism going along the arc here isn't homogeneous. There's actually quite a jump in densities from the south component of the Lao arc compared to the north, uh, indicating that there is a different type of input being supplied. Uh, and this can be explained really for some, uh, or the, an edge effect occurring from the, the subducting plate as it just sort of ends here. And this acts a bit like a paddle being passed through water, where it's actually pulling in new have toroidal mantle flows circulating it around, introducing more uh, mantle magma that's increasing the densities um, in, the, in the arc to the north. This is also reflected in crustal thickness, so I, the font might be a bit small, I apologize for that, but we have crustal thickness in this plot here showing increase, and then with crustal thickness you can calculate arc growth rate in kilometers cubed per kilometer down the arc per million years. 
where you see there's a huge jump or uh, anomaly in growth rate underneath here where you have that additional mantle melt circulating in. Uh, you have a break in, and that's explained by the faunal eye spreading center cutting in, so that just created an avenue for the mantle melt to escape out, so there's less melt piling up underneath there. Um, an additional anomaly down here is sort of in this little divot uh, where we have a seamount chain subducting down, um, and I believe that this is similar to the Chilean orocline, where you can have focused uh, focus force from the subducting plate actually create a bunch of crustal shortening and rotation. So in this case in Chile, um, they have a bunch of shortening happening uh, inland here and then rotation of the crust occurring on either side. We've seen the same rotation occurring to either side here and then that sort of explains the shortening going on. Um, but unfortunately, because of the angle of this seamount chain, or maybe not unfortunately, for better or for worse, it's actually swiping down the, the length of the arc. This isn't going to be focused pressure at one point in the same way it is in Chile. So you're unlikely to have increased metal endowment occurring here in the same way that you had to create the Bolivian tin belt and whatnot in Chile, but uh, interesting feature that increased uh, arc growth rate along the arc. And then here is a 3D plot just to help see it again in 3D that in addition to the subducting seamount chain uh, increasing growth rate in the arc where it's sort of pinching in here and adding some shortening. It also appears that where it first hit, so if you kind of rewind this back in time, when the seamount chain first collided with the Lao Basin, it seemed to create, it's hard to tell if it's a tear, but at the very least um, a big divot in the subducting plate. And we think that this is creating an avenue for those toroidal mantle flows to come in, because directly, directly above that you have the thick volcanic fields. So here volcanoes are shown as these triangles following the same color convention, so blue low density, high or red high density in there. Doing the same thing for all the different assemblages, so we have the matte polygons, we can start calculating average crustal thicknesses and average densities for each of the different groups um, in the Lao Basin. So I just color them based on assemblage types. So you have orange back arc rifts and spreading centers, these purples are the back arc volcanoes, you have other uh, arc back arc transition, the active arc, the ridges for arc, and whatnot. And you can also calculate crustal growth rate in kilometers cubed per year. So create a little table here just to summarize all of that. But we'll start off by looking at crustal thickness. So as you might expect, where you have the most extension is going to be in the back arc rifts and spreading center assemblages. And that's where you see the thinnest crust, about 10 kilometers. Um, but what was a bit more of a surprise is just how thick these volcanic fields can actually grow in the middle of the basin where they can, on average, are about 15 kilometers thick, which is about on par with the active arc. Looking also at present growth rate, so this is just taking the assemblages that are at the moment growing and looking at what uh, at the sort of cumulative growth rate that each of them are, are contributing to the, the growth of the Lao Basin. Still, as you'd expect, the back arc rifts and spreading centers provide the most. But these back arc volcanoes also provide a significant portion. I think 18% is still quite high. Um, but a big distinction between these two is that it's in these back arc rifts and spreading centers where you have hydrothermal systems that are longer lived, much more uh, higher currents, hydrothermal systems forming that would form VMS deposits, where it isn't going to be in these back arc volcanoes that you're going to want to look for those. And the big distinction between the two of them is in the rifts are much thinner, but in these back arc volcanoes, are going to be thicker. Both of them are forming mafic crust. Uh, their densities are both very similar, but it's in the crustal thickness. You can really tell the difference between the two of them. And then here's just a little summary, putting some numbers to some of the stuff that Mark and Alan talked about, about the distinction of the, uh, the northern and southern Lao Basin. So north, a little bit thicker, a little bit denser, uh, but what stands out is that it's uh, growing at three times the rate of the south component, um, so at 1.15 kilometers cubed per year, uh, which is just a number, but I guess just to, to put it in reference, um, all spreading center, or oh, sorry, all mid ocean ridges uh, across the world are producing 18 kilometer, or 18 cubic kilometers per year, so one's actually pretty substantial for just, just this northern segment here. But now working, moving over to the Abitibi. Um, so I was looking to do the same workflow, so the same type of 3D 
uh, gravity modeling in the Abba to be get that surface density map, but also get that crustal thickness map. So here's looking at the plan view for the density map through the Abitibi, and then because you need to check it against the seismic um, to make sure your model is working okay, I use the lithoprobe transect, that's sort of this piecewise north to south transect passing through, and then this is shown here in the different segments with the moho from the lithoprobe as a dotted white line, the moho from the model is black, and then that cross 2.0 model as those dots, um, which I think that fits quite good. And then from that, you can subtract the elevation of the MOHO from your topography data, and you'll get a crustal thickness map of the TV. So start off by looking at just the density map. Um, nothing too groundbreaking really coming out of here, I don't think. It seems like the main distinction is that, as you expect, the mafic rocks are denser, the felsic plutons are less dense. Uh, I also, so here I've drawn on the different types of faults and structures, and then the dots are VMS deposits. So no real correlation between VMS occurrence and surface density, other than the fact that you know the VMS form in the mafic volcanics, as you'd expect. Um, and then here I've just tossed on the outlines for the, the felsic plutons who are showing that those line up with those density lows. But then if we look at the crustal thickness map, I think this might be a bit more informative for the occurrence of VMS. Uh, so here is a map where I just have the, the VMS dots on there, and then this has all the, the scribblings of interpretations on it, just to have, you can compare back and forth. Um, but here the white lines are the major crustal faults that I've left in. I took out the minor faults, and then I've drawn in interpretations for proposed spreading centers of rifts, which are pretty much aligning along these zones of extension where you have crustal thinning. So thin crust being blue, and then the red. Uh, representing thicker crust. And there seems like uh, a bit of a correlation here between where you have these zones of extension of potential rifting or uh, seafloor spreading and the occurrence of VMS deposits. Here it is compared to the Abitibi map, so showing the different assemblages. And then I put together this little bar plot here showing number of VMS per assemblage type, and then using Taus's data did the, the same with area. Pretty much just to show that uh, like not all assemblages are sort of made equal. Just because you have more area in certain doesn't mean you necessarily have more VMS. And a similar uh, pattern is seen in the presence of these zones of extensions. Uh, sort of in Deloro and Stoughton Rickmore, where you can have quite a bit of uh, area. So sort of this area here, Stoughton Rickmore, um, than for, sorry, Tisdale. This is thicker crust with not very much VMS compared to the other ones. So this is just a hypothesis. This might be more, uh, these assemblages are formed as sort of those volcanic fields that still produce the volcanic crust, but were much thicker and less conducive for forming VMS as opposed to the other assemblages that could have formed through spreading or rifting. And then those would have been uh, more conducive for VMS to, to grow along those areas. And then another interpretation put down is to notice there's a bit of a pattern between uh, the geometry of the proposed spreading centers and where these crustal faults are. And there almost seems to be a sandwich where you'll have the zones of extension, then either side you'll have crustal faults, and then either side of that you'll have these thickened areas of crust. Um, so Alan touched on this a bit, but, but proposing that these crustal faults were formed in the extension of, of these areas where you'll have a sort of ancient seafloor extension uh, expanded out, you'll have the faults come in, and then those faults will have been reactivated during compression uh, and allow gold mineralization to form on and but will have originated originally through um, extension of these groups. So just in conclusion, uh, put together uh, two 3D density models, one of the Lao base and one of the Abitibi using the Lao Basin as a proxy to sort of double check what characteristics of volcanic fields spreading the ridges look like, and then using that to try and identify similar features in the Abba Tibi. Uh, and then coming back to my objective really, which was trying to quantify some kind of metric for endowment. I haven't quite done that yet, because the next step is really to look at non-endowed areas. I've only looked at the Abba Tibi, so I'm hoping to produce similar crustal thickness maps in the Wawa and the Wabagoon and then be able to compare those to the Abitibi um, and then pull something from there. Uh, so thanks.
So. Yeah, that's what like, we're hoping with the Abbot TV that it's reasonably well. Oh, uh, just wondering in in is the the deformation that's happened since the formation of of the Abbot TV would any of the features and crustal thickness have been masked? Yeah, so that was one concern. Um, so hoping that I guess through the preservation of the of the the Abbot TV that it wouldn't have been mixed up too much. Um, but you do see. I guess where where you've had uh, in the capus casing uplift zone, this is since formations. This wouldn't have been interpreted as uh, sort of a rift or spreading center because you would have had uplifted lower crust. Um, but I suppose just hoping that because of the the geometry of the abatibi that you've had primarily shortening and you haven't had as much rotation or rolling, that the the geometry of the moho would have been reasonably well preserved. And then comparing it, I guess, to the rifted margin modeling that, that sort of Kim Welford had done in the past, showing that they are generally preserved in, in areas of compression and whatnot. So, sorry, wish-washy answer, but yeah. Yeah, part of it's the, the compression that happened to the abitibi, but also in the Archean, the crust was also just a lot thicker than it is in modern day crust now. Um, so that pretty much explains uh, the difference. I think you can still get the breakout, just rifting and spreading would have been much slower because the crust is much thicker, but you could still get sort of breakout of, of microplates uh, in thicker crust. Like when the abitibi was opening, what, what was the speed yeah, of the rifting? So or? Uh, I haven't calculated that. I guess I haven't looked at rate of extension. Yeah. But something I'll look into. <laughs> 